And a very warm welcome to you to here at Nantes Lane this morning, on the 28th of November. It's lovely to be gathered this last Sunday of the month, the first Sunday of Advent and the run-up to Christmas. Wonderful to be gathered this morning together on this Lord's Day to worship our God. If you're joining us online, on YouTube, then a special warm welcome to you. Everything you need for the service is just under the screen. You'll find all the words to the hymns and the Bible reading as well from Mark chapter 12. Please uh, bear with me this morning. We have a, a couple of notices just to draw your attention to. You'll find on the order of service just a few things coming up in the run-up to Christmas to, uh, to tell you about before. Uh, just a note, uh, we will be having tea and coffee after the morning service in the hall at the back. Uh, but due to the new COVID restrictions that the Prime Minister announced yesterday, please, when you're in the hall and you're walking around, uh, please wear masks. And then you can take the mask off when you're sat down having your tea and having your coffee and eating your biscuit. So when you're standing up, moving around, have your masks on, and then you can take them off when you sit down. Uh, this afternoon we have our, our youth Bible class at four o'clock, it's been by Dave, and then Lord willing this evening I'll be leading and preaching here. Next Sunday we've got uh, Lord's Supper we'll be celebrating in the morning, uh, Lord willing David Pfeiffer from Wadden Road will be preaching for us in the evening and I'll be at Cooper's Edge uh, this next Sunday evening. This week, Wednesday, we have our mum's Bible study at half past one, and then at 7.30 in the evening, we have our midweek prayer meeting here. Thursday, we have an elders meeting, Thursday afternoon. Uh, Friday, we have the Jam Club, that's our children's group for primary age children. And then Friday is the next Ladies Fellowship, that's at half past seven, is that right, Cathy? And is that Cathy's house? Yes, Kathy is nodding. It's at Kathy's house. If you're a lady, then you're very welcome to join Kathy for that and, well, and the other ladies for that. Ladies' Fellowship Friday, half past seven. Then Saturday, Saturday the 4th, I think it's the next catalyst. I think. Larry probably sent an email in the, in, early in the week if that's correct. And next Saturday as well, we've now got printed our Christmas flyers. So normally at Christmas we advertise our Christmas services. So there's, they're at the front there. Uh, we've got a, a Christmas at Norton Lane general flyer with all the details of our Christmas services. They're also on your order of service. Uh, we're not on the. They're also on a sheet there that Helen's kindly printed off. Uh, so Sunday the 19th at six o'clock will be our carol service. 19th of December. Uh, this year we're going to have a, a service on Christmas Eve. It's going to be a children's carol service. We're going to invite the children from the local school, the families from local area, advertise it. Uh, that's Christmas Eve, a children's carol service here, 4 o'clock till 4.45. And then Christmas Day, 10 o'clock. And then Sunday, 26th, Boxing Day, our normal times, 10.30 and 6 o'clock. So there's... A flyer for that, and then a separate flyer as an invitation for the children's carol service. So if you know any, any children, any children in your family, any neighbours, friends, then do please take, take the children's carol service one and invite, invite people to it. We're gonna, we've organised to have, on Saturday the 4th of December, for whoever is able to make it, to meet at the hall, and we'll have a, a morning where we gather together and then go out flyering the area as we've done before in the past. I'll sort out the flyers. If you're able to make it that Saturday, grab a pile and we'll have donuts, coffee, that, that kind of thing as an incentive afterwards, not before, otherwise your flyering might be a bit slower. So afterwards, which means you'll do it faster to get back for the coffee before it gets cold. So that's Saturday the 4th of December. Meet in the church hall if you're able to at 10 o'clock. If you can't make it that day, I'm sure that there will be uh, bags of flyers available on the table for you to take if you're able to and to do at another time. If you can't do any of that, then please don't worry. Praying is one of the most important things we can do. Praying as these flyers go out, inviting friends and neighbours, taking some there. 
So that's the Christmas services coming up in just a few weeks' time. And let's start praying now that the Lord will bring people in from the area, children, families, people who live on the streets to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. And then Saturday the 11th of December, 4 till 7pm of a Christmas open house, a social up at our house from 4 till 7. There'll be mince pies, all the delicious treats you see in Audi will be there, I expect. Or other more expensive supermarkets. Please feel free to come any time between 4 and 7. If you come at 5 to 7, there may not be much left, but you'll still be very welcome. Let's come to hear our call to worship now this morning from Isaiah chapter 40. God calls us to worship him. Have you not known, have you not heard, the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. This is the God we worship today, our God, the everlasting God, the creator who does not faint or grow weary. Let us pray as we begin our worship this morning. Our great and our everlasting, almighty God, as we come out of the cold and to the warmth today, as we come to worship you, Please help us be engaged in our, in our minds and our hearts and our whole lives to, to worship you this morning and this whole day that you've given us. Please remind us as we pray, as we sing, as we hear from your word, remind us that you are the everlasting God, that you are good, that you are gracious and more wonderful than we could know. Remind us of these things for so often we forget Help us and bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing together our first song and hymn of praise. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand?
Let us come to our God as we pray together. Our great and majestic God, the Lord of the cosmos, the creator of the universe, the one who spoke, who made all things in the space of six days and all very good, the Lord Most High. We come before your throne this morning, we who are unworthy, not even to gather the crumbs from under your table, and yet we come, we come not afraid or cowering, we come confidently because we come in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come not just as, as guests around your table, we come as sons and daughters of the King. We come as your beloved and blood-bought children. We thank you that you are beyond compare. You are beyond our understanding. Forgive us when we can have such a small view of you, when we can box you in into standards that we, that we create, thinking you're just a slightly bigger version of ourselves. When you are totally other, you are beyond all comparison. The Lord God, the one who knows the weight of all the dust of the mountains, the one who can hold the oceans in the hollow of your hand, the one who is glorious and the king who is enthroned on high, we come before you as your people. What a privilege it is to belong to you, our God. Who else is like you? All other things that people worship are created things. They cannot speak, they cannot hear, they cannot do anything. But we worship the Lord our God, the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, in whom we live and breathe and have our being. The Lord who spoke and all things came into existence. We thank you that we can come and hear you speak today as we come and sit under your word. Please do a great, a great work today, we pray, in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to confess our sin together this morning. You'll see in the order of service. <coughs> Let us confess our sin aloud together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the freedom you have given us through the life, death and resurrection of your Son. But we confess today that we often live like slaves. Instead of living like you delight in us, we avoid you in shame and guilt. Instead of receiving your favour as a gift, we try to earn it with our efforts. Instead of accepting your freedom, we prefer our chains. Instead of pursuing your purposes, we cling to our short-sighted agendas. Forgive us, embrace us, cleanse us, heal us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us hear the wonderful assurance of our forgiveness, which we need reminding of day by day from 1 John, 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. May God bless this truth and this wonderful assurance to our hearts today. We're going to sing again of the glory and wonder of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ in our second hymn. My song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me, love to the loveless show. Let us stand and sing when the music begins.
<coughs> now it's time in the service for the children's talk. So children, I'd like to invite you to come down to the front. <coughs> Hello, I can see the, the two sensible girls are wearing coats and the uh, two boys are wearing uh, Christmas jumpers and t-shirts. Welcome, very nice to see you all. Now, I have a couple of questions to ask you today, okay? And have you seen this kind of book before? You have? Oh, well, you should know these questions like this and the, the children's catechism. Okay, are you ready? Who made you? Anna. God. God. What else did God make? William. Everything. That's right. Everything. Question three. Why did God make you and everything? Clara. For his own glory. That's right. For his own glory. Now, this is the question I want to focus on this morning. How, how can you glorify God? Hannah. By loving him and doing what he commands. That's right, by loving him and doing what he commands. Now, that's what, what we're going to be thinking about today. Part of our passage from Mark chapter 12, Jesus is going to answer a question. Now, a scribe came to Jesus, and a scribe, anyone know what a, what a scribe does? Don't worry if you don't know. A scribe is like a lawyer. Anyone know what a lawyer is? You don't need to know yet. A lawyer is someone who's an expert in the law. And a scribe was an expert in the law. And he asked Jesus a very important question. He comes to Jesus and he says, What's the most important commandment? What's the most important commandment of all the commandments? Any ideas? Hannah? All of them are important. That's right, that's very true. But Jesus, he answers a similar way. He answers by kind of summarising all... Anyone, can anyone name any of the Ten Commandments? Any of the Ten Commandments? Can you name any? Clara? Paul? Any of the Ten Commandments? Hannah, can you name any? Do not steal. Do not steal. William? Do not lie. That's right. Yes, keep Sunday special. That's right. There's lots of, well, there's ten, aren't there? And Jesus summarised all the Ten Commandments by saying, it says this. Anyone read what this says? What does it say, Anna? <coughs> That's right, that's the Matthew passage. We're looking at the Mark one today. He says, that's it. He says, this is the most important thing that you need to remember and do. Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength, Jesus says as well. That's the most important. It's loving the Lord your God with all your heart. That's all your feelings, all your emotions, who you are as a person. With all your mind, all that you think about. Honouring God with your thoughts. With all your strength, that's how you use your body. How you use your feet and your legs and your hands and your ears and your eyes. Loving the Lord your God by listening and what you look at and how you speak. It's loving the Lord your God with your whole body with your whole person, with everything you do, all for the glory of God. That's difficult, isn't it, to do? That's why. So we need help, don't we? And we need help from the Holy Spirit to help us to obey and to love the Lord our God with all our soul, with all our heart, with all our mind, and with all our strength. Shall we pray and ask for God's help? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you love us, that you gave your Son, Jesus, to die in our place. Please help us to love you 
with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. We find it hard, so please help us. Help us to show that loving you is far better than anything else. In Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, thank you for listening, children. You can go and sit back down. And as the children are heading back, it's now time in our service for giving our tithes and our offerings. We're going to pray again now and give thanks to God for what he's given us and to pray for ourselves and for others. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a generous God. We thank you that we can pray to you. We thank you that you provide for all our needs. We thank you that you answer all our prayers we thank you that you are wise and that your will for us is perfect and that you know how to answer our prayers better than we do. Help us not to be frustrated when sometimes your answer might be no or not yet. Help us to trust you that you know what's best and to know that, that nothing can separate us from your love. Thank you for these gifts that you've given us that we could give back to you today. Help us not to, to, give, to give with our, our physical things, but to give our whole lives to serve and to honour you. We thank you for each other. We thank you that we can uh, gather together as a family, Sunday by Sunday, Wednesday by Wednesday, to encourage one another, to pray together to enjoy fellowship together, to share our lives together. Help us to bear one another's burdens, to love one another. We pray, we pray for our dear sister Lynn Marie and for Dion and for Mia and Leah. We thank you for them, their example to us. Please help them. Please bring them comfort. Please sustain them and strengthen them at this time. Help us to know how we can help them, even in little ways, to remember them in our prayers. We pray that you may be with them and look after them, Father, in ways that we could never do. We thank you um, for our brother Chris. We pray that you'll be with him as he's preaching and ministering that congregation of St. Mary's in Gloucester this morning. We thank you for them, even though they are only very few in number. We thank you that they faithfully gather to worship you Sunday by Sunday. May they be greatly encouraged today. Please build them up, bring them a minister, add to their number. Father, we thank you for the presbytery meeting yesterday where we could gather together as, as, as brothers in Christ. We thank you for the new elder at Sullyhall, Johnny Umpleby. Thank you for building your church, that you are the king and chief builder of your church. We thank you for the building you provided them. Thank you they can meet over Christmas, even though the school they've been using is closed. We thank you for the new families and people you've been adding to Salford. Even though their minister has been unwell, please be with them and continue to encourage them. We pray that you will provide and raise up a man to lead and to minister at the, the congregation in Hull who have been without someone for so many years. Please be with them. Please bless them and bring the right man at the right time to, to minister to them. We pray for Gloucester as well. We thank you for Michael and Tim. Thank you for, even though they started that church plant just a few well, months ago, 18 months ago in lockdown, we thank you how you've blessed them. 
how you've been adding to their number and, and providing for them. Please continue to do so. May they grow in, from strength to strength. We pray for Wadden Road. We thank you for David and Larry. We pray for their uh, children's choir concert that's coming up on the 8th of December. We pray as they advertise and send invitations out to the uh, community around uh, the church, to the school there. We pray that many families, many children will come in to hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ sung and spoken of. Please do a great work, a great work there to bring many out of darkness into light. And please bless our Christmas services, our children's carol concert, a carol service, our carol service. Bless these flyers as they start to go out to the homes. Bless the flyer as they're advertised in the local school. Give us wisdom and, and eyes open to who we could invite and be praying for, that they might come, that our church might be filled with people to come and hear the good news of the Lord. We pray that you will bless this work and this, and this outreach this Christmas. Help us. Help us to be dependent completely on you, that you may build us up and bring in those who are lost to know the Lord Jesus as their Saviour and their King. In Jesus' name, Amen. Before we come to look at God's word together this morning. We're going to sing from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect and sound, for with it the soul is revived and crowned. Now Paul is going to come and read God's word to us this morning. This morning's reading is taken from Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 34. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the, the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself, is much more than all, 
whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, please speak to us now as we come to your word. Give us ears to hear and eyes to understand and to see wonderful things from your law. In Jesus' name, amen. Probably most of us here have been in this kind of situation, either growing up as a child or as parents, when you, you're going on a long journey. You pack up the car, you've been thinking about this journey, maybe you're travelling on holiday, and you start to pack up the car, it takes all morning because once a, you've packed a bag, someone usually comes along and then unpacks that bag, and so you have to then repack it again, and it's a wonderful experience going on this, on this long journey, going on holiday. So you load up all the car, you've got all the snacks ready, you know your route, you've planned it out, all out, and you're off. You're off on your journey, you start to go, and then possibly five minutes into the journey, sometimes, maybe a bit longer, you hear that wonderful question, that wonderful question that, that rings through your ears. Are we nearly there yet? Are we nearly there yet? You say, no, we've just set off. Are we nearly there yet? And the answer, when you're actually nearly there, is both good news and bad news, isn't it? It's both good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, we are nearly there. We're getting there. We're going to keep going. We are nearly there. The bad news is that we're not there yet. We're not yet there. We cannot get out of the car yet. So it's both good news and bad news. You may have heard it said, maybe if you've read John Bunyan's work, The Pilgrim's Progress, that the Christian life is like a journey, isn't it? The Christian life is like a journey, travelling to that celestial city. But sometimes as well, coming to faith in Christ Coming to believe and to trust upon Jesus alone as your Lord and Saviour, coming to that position can also be a journey, can't it? Can also be a journey that for some people could take years from initial interest and contact to actually confessing that they are a Christian and Jesus is their Lord. Sometimes people have wonderful conversion testimonies and experiences, but for lots of people, it can take a long time. It's a journey, isn't it? And this is how Jesus assesses the scribe who we just heard about from Mark chapter 12, 28 to 34. You see in verse 34, Jesus assesses this man. It says, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you are not far from the kingdom of God. You're not far. Now that's both good news. Is that you're nearly there. You're not far from the kingdom. You're on the right track. You're nearly there. You're not far. But it's also bad news. You're not there yet. So keep going. Keep going. I'm going to see from this story this morning... This, this man, as he nears, as he travels to the kingdom, as he travels to that inheritance of eternal life, that relationship with Jesus as his king, because the, the kingdom of God is not a, a place, it's a person, it's the king himself. As he travels to salvation with Jesus, we're going to see four stages to this journey from this passage. Three we see here in the passage, but then we'll also note one final step that this man needs to take from, to go from being near the kingdom to being in the kingdom. And this is important for us, isn't it, to think about. To think about because we here, 
maybe on this journey, maybe nearing the kingdom and not in it yet. We, know, we might know people in our families who might be showing some kind of interest nearing the kingdom, but not in it yet. And so this will help us how to pray, how to encourage them to keep going, how to direct them. So let's look at this traveling to the kingdom then. The first stage on the journey that we see with the scribe is that it begins with a surprising investigation in verse 28. A surprising investigation. Now this story here, this true story of the scribe coming up to Jesus should be a surprise to us because it's in the context of Jesus in the temple courts being confronted, being attacked all the way since the ele- at the end of chapter 11 when the council, the chief priests, the scribes and the elders stormed over to him. What authority are you doing these things by? And then you've had group after group. First the Pharisees, they go from in chapter 12, 13 to 17. They try and trap Jesus, try and trip him up about the question about paying taxes to Caesar. Then you have the Sadducees in the next group. They also try and try to humiliate him by coming up with that elaborate story about these seven brothers that marry this one woman trying to disprove or make the resurrection look ridiculous. But then here, we have one scribe who comes to Jesus. It says there in 28, isn't it? He came up and he heard them disputing. He heard what Jesus was saying. He heard their, their conversation. He was listening. He was interested. And he was seeing that Jesus answered them well. He was, he was interested. He was impressed with Jesus. Jesus is someone I want, to, I want to talk to, I want to know more about. He's someone who speaks well. And this is surprising, not just in the immediate context of confrontation and uh, an attack against Jesus, and then the following passages leading to Jesus' arrest and his trial, but also this is, and I believe this scribe is coming sincerely to Jesus, as we saw in verse 30, 34, Jesus' kind of imp- impressiveness of him, Jesus' commendation of this man. You've answered wisely. You are near the kingdom. That's encouraging. That this scribe is sincerely asking Jesus this question, not trying to trap him or or trick him like others were trying to do. And this is surprising because in Mark, the Pharisees have always been against Jesus so far. In chapter 2, remember with the man who was paralyzed, who was lowered down through the roof, It was the Pharisees and the scribes who were accusing Jesus as blasphemy when he was saying, this man, your sins are forgiven. In chapter 2 as well, remember when Jesus met with Matthew or Levi, the tax collector. It was again the scribes with the Pharisees who were saying, who were grumbling, why do you eat with sinners and tax collectors? In chapter 3, again, it was the scribes who accused Jesus of being in league with the demons. And then in chapter 11, 27, who, which group comes with the chief priests and the elders? It's the scribes, the experts in the law. All through Mark, they've been those against Jesus. They've been attacking and confronting Jesus. And yet here, amazingly, surprisingly, One of the scribes has come up and heard them disputing and seeing that Jesus answered well, he then genuinely, sincerely wants to investigate more just who this Jesus is. It's a a surprising investigation that from a, a context of confrontation, of evil and wicked intent against Jesus to get rid of him, comes this wonderful ray of light. Like if we were driving yesterday, driving up to Birmingham for the presbytery meeting, and there were great dark clouds, but then in one part of the sky, there was beautiful shafts of light as the sun was just peering through. 
That's what you have here in a context of darkness, storms against Jesus. You have a, a shaft of light. It's a surprising investigation. It's a striking picture, isn't it? A surprising picture. I don't know if you've seen the pictures, probably closer to Remembrance Day. Sometimes they have them on the news, don't they? With after World War I, the, the battlefields in France, which were the scenes of such sadness, death, hostility, and yet afterwards, all these beautiful poppies came out. A sea of red poppies in, in what was before a horrific scene. And yet from that, from that context, grows these beautiful flowers. Because... Grace can begin to grow and work in people's lives that they start to investigate in surprising places. You see how the scribe, his journey begins as he's traveling to the kingdom. He begins from a surprising place. He was part of that group of scribes who were against Jesus, plotting to be rid of him. And yet as the word of God went out, as Jesus spoke, remember the parable of the sower? The, the sower generously scatters seeds. Some land on a path and are snatched away. Some land on rocky soil. Some land among thorns and thistles. Some land in good soil. Amongst all those places that the word of the Lord that Jesus has been speaking as they've been listening, the seed of his word is has hit this scribe and has hit good soil and has began to grow and he's impressed with Jesus and he wants to find out more. And this should encourage us. This should encourage us as we reach out to our area, as we reach out with Christmas, as we sow the seed of the word of God that yes, lots of it may land on paths, may land on rocky soil. People may get excited and then we never see them again. People may come. We pray. We pray that for some, if not most, if not all of the people who come, that the seed of the word of God will land in good soil in their hearts, will land in good soil and will produce fruit and will grow but it begins, doesn't it, with this surprising investigation. Being interested and curious. And you might know people like this who are starting to, to show an interest. There's a, they were, they might have been hostile before. But now they're starting to say, oh, how was church on Sunday? Well, what was it like? Well, what did you do? They're, they're not saying, oh, I love Jesus. They're not there yet, but they're starting. They're starting to investigate and sometimes can come from surprising places. And so pray. Nobody, nobody is beyond the reach of our God. It begins with this surprising investigation. Secondly, you see that there's a revealing question in 29 to 31, a question that reveals something about the scribe and something that reveals about the kingdom itself. The scribe, who is an expert in the law, he asked Jesus a question in verse 29. says in verse 28, which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, the most important is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now, this wasn't an unusual question. This wasn't an uncommon question. Scribes, Rabbis, teachers would, would be, have been debating this kind of question. Which, which law of all the 613 commandments that they were, which one's the most important? Which one's the one that, that kind of summarizes them all? Which is the most supreme? That if I'm going to kind of focus on one, 
which one? Because they would divide them into kind of more weightier commands and lighter commands. Or which one is the most supreme? And again, Jesus' answer is not unusual. This comes from Deuteronomy 6, verse 4. That famous verse is called the Shema, the you hear. It's what Jesus says here. Love the Lord, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. It's like our John 3.16, a, a, a Bible verse that, that most people would know off by heart. One of the, the first you would learn. This verse from Deuteronomy 6 would have been repeated and said daily. So again, Jesus' answer is not unusual. But his answer does reveal that the one Lord and the only true God in whose image you are made, talking back, thinking back to his conversation and discussion with the Pharisees, in whose image you are made, you, are, you have been made, the God of the resurrection, the all powerful God, the creator God, this one Lord whom you confess, expects nothing less than wholehearted devotion to him from his creatures. Do you describe someone a bit like the rich young ruler from Mark chapter 10 who came to Jesus and asking, what, what, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What can I do? And Jesus said to him, well, keep the commandments said, all these things I've done. And again, similar to that, this scribe comes to Jesus and asking, revealing in his heart, what must I do? What else can I do? You are someone I'm interested in, Jesus. I'm curious about you. You've spoken well. You're someone who seems to understand the word of God. Someone who understands the matters of theology and, and of the law. And so what do you think? What do I need to do. And Jesus says, you need to love God completely, exhaustively, wholeheartedly, with your whole person, with everything you are and everything you do, with all of your heart, with all of your affections, your will, your desires, your motivations, your personality, all of your strength how you act and use your body, how you speak. All of your mind, how you think, how you behave, how you make decisions. And it doesn't stop there. Jesus then quotes from Leviticus 19.18. You are then, which comes naturally from loving God, is that therefore you shall love your neighbour as yourself shall love your neighbour as yourself. If you truly love God wholeheartedly, then you will love also those things that he has made, those people who are made in his image. You will love your neighbour as yourself. You will love those that God loves. And that makes sense, doesn't it? To know if someone loves you that you can see how they act towards things that you love. So, for example, if you said you loved me, and you, uh, that sentence probably wouldn't come out of your mouth, but if you said you loved me, but then you were very rude to Rachel, you, you didn't like my children and treated them harshly, you, you came and trashed my house, then even though you said you love me, you haven't shown it. You haven't shown it by loving the things that I love that are valuable and precious to me. And so the same with God. We say, and the people would have confessed, the Lord our God is one. I love the Lord our God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. But flowing naturally from that must come and therefore we love our neighbour as ourselves. Because when you're loving God's creation, when you're loving your neighbour, his people, loving those who are also made in his image, you are loving God. Because you're loving what God loves. You're loving like 
God. It comes as a natural response. And people ask sincere questions, don't they? On their, on their journey to the kingdom, it might be a question like this. What, what's the kingdom like? What is it like to be a Christian? This answer here reveals what God expects. When you belong to him, when you're object of his love, object of his desire, that God expects a wholehearted love and devotion back to him. The whole of your life centered for the glory of God, shown by how you love God and how you love what God loves. So we've seen, firstly, a surprising investigation. Secondly, a, a revealing question. And thirdly, we see in this, in this journey to the kingdom that there's a remarkable commendation we see in 32 to 34. A remarkable commendation. The scribe, he commends Jesus after hearing what he said. He said, well said. I agree with what you said in verse 32. You are right, teacher. You have truly said. He agrees. He kind of says Jesus' answer back to him. Exactly what you said. That is exactly right. He began his journey with, with interest and curiosity of someone who spoke well, and now he admires Jesus. He thinks well of Jesus, and he shows this by agreeing with his answer. He says, you're right. But then he pushes it further as well, doesn't he? He says that this love of, for God and love for neighbour shouldn't just be with ex shown externally. But in the heart as well, and he quotes from Hosea 6, verse 6, which says, for I, this is what God says, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So I don't just want you to, to offer sacrifices, to offer burnt offerings, to, just to do things. I want you to love me with your whole heart. I want you to love your neighbour, not just by doing things externally, but from the heart. So he pushes it further, says, yes, Jesus, you're right. But it's more than that, isn't it? Isn't that what we've been looking at from 1 Corinthians 13? If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. His love from the heart is the key to these things. But it's remarkable, isn't it, that an expert of the law, this man of authority, that he is commending Jesus Christ. That he is saying to Jesus Christ, you speak very well. Well done, you have answered correctly. That should be remarkable when we remember who Jesus is. Just in chapter 11, he is the king who has come to Jerusalem. God's promised Messiah the offspring of David, whose reign shall never end. He is the Lord God Almighty. He is the Son of the living God. He is the perfect embodiment of love to God and love to neighbour, which should be shown wonderfully at the cross. He is the one true God and Lord that they are confessing. From Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, you, you see here how gently Jesus deals with the scribe. He doesn't say, of course I'm right. This is my word. No, he gently encourages him. He says, you have answered wisely. Well done. Like a, a parent dealing with a, a little child who answers something correct who asks a good question. See how Jesus here 
deals gently with this man who's showing curiosity and interest and and wanting to investigate. He's not trying to, to put him off. He's not trying to rush him along. He deals with him gently and lovingly, humbly stooping down like a, like a father crouching down on his knees to speak to a child. See how gentle Jesus is with him. See this scribe here, and we see this throughout Mark and the Bible, don't we? The New Testament especially, that once people meet with Jesus, when they hear Jesus, people are amazed They were enthralled by his wisdom, by his beauty, by his authority, his gentleness, his patience, his loveliness. That's what we should do as Christians, isn't it? The people who love the Lord Jesus, who are enthralled by him, his gentleness and his patience with us, how he deals with us in a caring and a loving and a humble way, how he is approachable, how his arms are wide open for us to come to him. And what do we do when when we seek to tell people the gospel? What do we do when we want people to come to know Jesus? And we just hold out, this is what Jesus is like. We can do that in what we say in what we do at church, but also how we live our lives. We are commending Christ, his, his wonder and magnificence and beauty and wisdom. Like if you, you've been to a great restaurant or you've seen a great film or, and you just can't stop talking about it, but it doesn't just, you don't just want to talk about it, you want to share it with others. Say, you need to go and try that restaurant over there. Like this new takeaway that's opened in Gloucester, Tim Hortons. Huge, great big queues, people talking about it. People saying, you've got to try their burgers. You've got to try their donuts. You've got to try it. Not just, oh, I had a really good time, but you need to try it too. You need to go and see that film. And that's what we should be like with Christ. When we taste and see how good he is, how wonderful he is, how gentle and how glorious he is and what he's done for us. We're holding him out to others. That's what we're doing Sunday by Sunday to a world in darkness. Outside those doors, we're holding out the glory and the wonder of the Lord Jesus Christ, commending him to others with how we live for his honour, how we love one another, how we love our neighbour. And we see how Jesus commends him with these encouraging words. You are not far from the kingdom. You are not far. Again, as we said at the beginning, both good news. You're nearly there. But also bad news. You're not there yet. Keep going. Like the encouragement of a, of a teacher. Maybe you had a teacher like this at school. Who, when you are really struggling with a... It's normally maths problems, isn't it? When you are really struggling with a maths equation or something, you just can't get it and the teacher doesn't say, that's rubbish, just give up now, go home. No, the teacher encourages, or they should do. The teacher, teacher crouches down next to you and says, keep going, keep trying, you're doing really well, you're going to get there. Just keep going. You're nearly there. See, the scribe does. He knows, doesn't he? He knows that he must love God with all his heart and soul and mind and strength and love his neighbour. He knows that it must be from the heart. He's come to Jesus. But he's not in the kingdom yet. He's near, but he's not in. He's got the knowledge. He's an expert in the law. He's an expert in the word of God. He's got the knowledge. He's got the background. He's got the understanding. He admires Jesus. He admires Jesus as a great teacher, as a wise man. But that's not enough. And many people get this far, don't they? They think well of Jesus. It's a common opinion about who Jesus is. Yes, yeah, he's a good teacher, a moral man. They get this far. They admire Jesus, 
They might know some of the Bible. Maybe children who have been raised with Christian parents might know the right answers. They admire Jesus. Must beware of resting our hopes on mere intellectual knowledge. There's still one more step. One more step to going from nearing the kingdom to entering the kingdom. And that's our fourth thing and final thing we'll look at this morning started with a surprising investigation a revealing question a remarkable commendation and finally that ultimate realization that ultimate realization because the kingdom is not a place it's a relationship a relationship with the king and so it's not just admiring Jesus as teacher but bowing before him as Lord and Saviour. The final step, not just admiring Jesus as a good and wise man, but bowing before him as Lord, adoring him wholeheartedly as Saviour, realising that those two great commandments that Jesus spoke of, that the, that the scribe agreed with, Realising that we cannot do it. We cannot love God like that. We cannot love neighbour like that. We've all failed. All have fallen short, as Paul says. All have sinned against God. All are guilty and deserving of judgment and commendation. We cannot earn our way into the kingdom or work our way into the kingdom. It is realising, ultimate, that it is only through the way that Jesus Christ has opened up. Out of his free grace and his abounding mercy, he is days away from the cross. It's at the cross that the door to the kingdom will be swung wide open. You can come in. You can come in because of what I've done. Because without me, you have no chance at all. Through God sending his only son to open that way that those who trust and rest on Jesus Christ alone will inherit that eternal life. Will enjoy that everlasting relationship with the King of Kings, with the Son of God. Will be able to grow and grow through the sanctifying work of the Spirit in love for God and love for others. It's not just through admiring Jesus, but through trusting and resting on Christ alone for your salvation, bowing to him as Lord. It was as John Newton, the one who wrote the hymn Amazing Grace, as he was nearing death, he said that, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very clearly. I am a great sinner. And Christ is a great saviour. That ultimate realisation that I can't, that Jesus has. And we don't know what happened to this scribe. That's the end of the story as recorded here in Mark. You are near the kingdom. No one else down here asked them more questions. We don't know if he then took that final step afterwards. We can ask ourselves the same question, can't we? Where are you on the journey? Are you near the kingdom or are you in the kingdom? Can you not just say that Jesus Christ is the Lord and the Saviour, but can you say in your heart that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Saviour? To be a great encouragement to us, to those that we know in our family, our loved ones, our neighbours who are maybe beginning to investigate, maybe aren't even starting to investigate, that we pray. We pray that they would begin this journey. And you see Jesus, how he gently and lovingly encourages this man along from just interest to admiration. And then that final step, may God help us and those weary travellers that we know to see the glory of the kingdom, to see the wonder of Christ, to hold out 
that invitation, that free invitation, come, whoever you are, whatever you've done, come and welcome to Jesus. Let us pray together. Our gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that there is a way that he has opened up for us. We thank you that we can come to you, not by anything that we've done, but because of the finished and accomplished work of Christ on the cross. Help us to delight, to love, and to adore the Lord Jesus Christ and to commend him with our words and with our lives. That those that we know and love at this Christmas, as well as other times, may come may begin that journey or may go further, nearing and entering the kingdom. In Jesus' name, Amen. As we close our worship uh, service this morning, we're going to sing our final hymn together. Have you heard the voice of Jesus softly pleading with your heart? Have you felt his presence glorious as he calls your soul apart. People of the living God, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forever. Amen.